Hi everyone, I'm Rob Chipman and I do reduction block prints. I'm also uh, president of the uh, Intermountain Society of Artists, so I know many of you who will be watching this and uh, those of you who I haven't met, I hope to soon. Our organization is uh, growing and uh, even navigating these challenging times of COVID. We've been able to do a lot of plein air events and uh, meeting intermittently. Now with the numbers up as high as they are, we've uh, uh, we're not able to meet for the next little while, but uh, thought this would be a good way to continue one of our missions, which is uh, uh, being able to share skills and experience of a lot of different uh, artists. Um, I've had a lot of people because uh, particularly in our organization, my uh, particular uh, approach to creating art is uh, somewhat unique. I've had a lot of people that have asked me about, um, about my process and how I do what I do, why I'm crazy enough to do <laughs> what I do. And, um, and uh, so when Charlotte talked to me about uh, uh, doing a uh, a demo, I was uh, glad to do so, but I thought it would make more sense to be in the context of a variety of uh, different kinds of uh, uh, printmaking um, uh, approaches. And uh, so I thought it would be good to have uh, Stephanie do the first part, and, um, and then I would drill down a little more specifically in a little more detail uh, in a, into what I do. Uh, Stephanie's been a, a great uh, mentor, uh, not, only to, not only to me, but uh, a lot of different uh, artists and, and printmakers, and has been uh, very supportive. Saltgrass has been such a, a, a great place for me. I used to do these at, at home, uh, which my wife didn't appreciate because I kind of took over the, the, the kitchen. And uh, here I, I've got access to... Uh, nice presses and ink and uh, ready supply of paper, which of course we pay for, but um, and drying racks and uh, can come in any hour of the, the day or night to, to do my work. And so it, it's uh, really been a, a, a great thing for, for me. Also uh, switching over from water-based inks to oil-based inks, which uh, is easier to do here than it, than it was at home in, in the kitchen has um, enabled me to get higher quality prints in my estimation. Um, even though some of these oil-based inks are uh, water, you can clean up with soap and water, um, they, they seem to penetrate the, the paper uh, better, the absorption is better, and I get higher quality prints. And uh, so this has really been a, a great thing for me. So block printing, and basically, I use uh, I use both linoleum. Uh, here's a, uh, a piece of uh, unmounted linoleum, which I mostly use, but I've also done uh, wood. Uh, Stephanie showed you, showed you some of those. Here's a, a, a wood block print that I did not that long ago. Wasn't all that happy with it and actually did another one uh, on linoleum because it seemed to work a little better. You can also get linoleum that's mounted. You can either mount it yourself or buy it at Blink, Blick, uh, mounted on uh, different size shapes. And uh, that's maybe a little easier to work with just because it, it's um, heftier and easier to hold on to while you're, while you're carving. So when I refer to uh, block printing, um, it can either be uh, a lino cut or a wood cut. The process is exactly the, the same. Um, woodcuts have been around for s centuries. They were really uh, the uh, means by which uh, books were illustrated. Um, and uh, the Japanese really uh, seemed to perfect it as an art form. You may not be aware, but Monet actually had a large collection of uh, Japanese wood prints that, that, that inspired him, as did uh, other artists. Um, you can do a, a simple lino cut uh, or wood cut that's just a, a single color, whether it's uh, black or any other color you want to do, and 
you may have even done something like that, carving in a potato uh, and printing it on a piece of paper is basically that same uh, process. In order to get multiple colors, uh, there is one of two approaches that um, you can take. Um, there is a multi-block method where you're doing a different block for each color layer. You can do a key block that allows you to transfer the, the outline and design to each of the successive blocks and then you just carve away everything but that color you're going to use. Um, and then there's the um, uh, reduction method, which is what I use. And that is you use the same block and then print a layer and then carve away what you printed and then print the next color layer and carve that away. And so at the end of the day, uh, there's very little left of the block uh, that has a printable service, surface. And um, it is by default, a limited edition because once you get to that point it is impossible to to reprint anymore and uh, so that adds to uh, the, the uh, risk level also if you carve away something you shouldn't have which I have done um, you pretty much have to start over uh, with the multi multi-block approach um, if you do that, you can just redo that one block as opposed to starting over. So there's a little less risk involved in uh, multi-block. Obviously, you're using more blocks, but um, um, I kind of like the, the, the risk and reward equation in, uh, uh, in the reduction method. It also requires you to think quite strategically so that um, you're, you're thinking through, okay, what color I'm gonna do? Am I gonna do first? What's the second color and third color? There's some you know, transparency issues with inks and you can make them more and less transparent, but lighter colors, uh, it's harder for them to cover darker colors. And so I tend to work light to dark. Sometimes I'll work from the top down if I'm starting with a sky and I've got darker elements below, but typically uh, light to dark, which is the opposite, I think, of uh, uh, a lot of uh, painters. Um, and then once I've carved away those lighter areas, uh, then nothing will go on, on top of them. And um, so it's, uh, it, the, the, the sequence and the process is very important. Also, because you're working in reverse, because you're you're printing the image on the block is the exact reverse of what you want on the paper. And sometimes that can be uh, a little disorienting, particularly if it's a, a landmark, like when I was doing my series of Mount Olympus prints, to continue looking that on the block backwards, it doesn't look anything like Mount Olympus. And it's, it's kind of disorienting. Uh, same thing with the uh, uh, Mount Timpanogos prints I just did. So those are very prominent landmarks and you recognize them immediately when you look at them. But when you're looking at them in reverse, it's less so. And, and uh, so that adds, adds to the uh, challenge of, of, of this process. But um, so you've got uh, an idea in mind of what you want to uh, print. It could be from a photo you've taken or something you can even just uh, imagine. I typically work from photos. Uh, I, I, I tend to lean towards landscapes, but I've done some simpler fruits and vegetables and cacti series, some uh, uh, architectural things with the Brigham Young farm home up at uh, this is the place, uh, Heritage Park. But mostly, mostly landscapes, I'm drawn to landscapes in Utah. We live in a beautiful state and access to beautiful mountain scenes up north and beautiful red rock formations down south. And um, we've got a lot to show off here in, in Utah and I'm, I'm glad to do it. And what you end up creating with this kind of uh, a print is uh, kind of an approximation of, of that original scene, but recreated in, in, in kind of a, a unique way. It has a very uh, graphic quality, uh, kind of a contemporary 
uh, look that, uh, that I enjoy. So once I settle on a scene, um, I'll, the, the first step in the process is to do a sketch. My sketches are usually pretty, uh, pretty simple. Most of the detail comes in when I cut. So here's an example. I put this over a piece of white paper. Um, this is uh, the Teton scene, the Teton trio I did. And I usually do my sketches on uh, tracing paper. The reason being is that um, I can flip that over and get my reverse image uh, uh, very easily when I do that. You see up here at the top, this is my listing of what colors I do when. That isn't necessarily set in concrete. I may change that as, uh, as time goes on when I, or I may add a color layer that, where I think it needs it, or I may eliminate one. But uh, this one has 12 different colors on it. I think I was able to do it in 11 different layers, because sometimes you can do multiple layers if they're separated enough on the block uh, on the same layer. So I'll take that uh, tracing paper and then flip it around and put it on the block. And then with a sharp ballpoint pen or something like that, I'll, I'll go over that, transfer the image uh, onto the block and uh, I'll, I'll show you some pictures. I'll drop in some, some photos in the, in the video with a little better detail uh, of this. And uh, once I transfer that image, I'll go over that because it's pretty faint. And if I'm doing multiple layers, um, I want to make that more uh, permanent. And so I'll go over what I've transferred with a, a, with a black Sharpie or another color Sharpie a uh, permanent sharpie, so that um, it it that image doesn't go away when I clean off the block after the after the first layer. It'll get more faint. In fact, I usually have to wipe it off with alcohol so that image doesn't transfer onto the uh, paper. So it just needs to be dark enough for me to see. And then um, once I've transferred uh, the image to the block and um, uh, put Sharpie, permanent marker, on that drawing, then I can, I can start cutting. Now sometimes uh, I will print the entire block with a, with a color. If it's gonna be, you know, maybe a light tan or, or, or something like that. Um, and uh, so I'll be putting other colors on top of that. If I, if I want anything white, I actually carve that out very first thing. And that's actually just the white of the paper coming through. Um, and, um, and, and that's how I get white. You can use white ink, uh, obviously, but uh, if you're using a, a white paper, anything you carve away won't ever get uh, ink on it again, and that stays uh, stays white. So um, that's usually the first step if there's, uh, if there's white is to carve that out first. And then once I go through my list, I'll start and uh, say I may want to do a, uh, so I'll go over what I've transferred with a, a, with a black Sharpie or another color Sharpie, a uh, permanent Sharpie, so that um, it, it, that image doesn't go away when I clean off the block after the, after the first layer. It'll get more faint. In fact, I usually have to wipe it off with alcohol so that image doesn't transfer onto the uh, paper. So it just needs to be dark enough for me to see. And then um, once I've transferred uh, the image to the block and um, uh, put Sharpie, permanent marker, on that drawing, then I can, I can start cutting. Now sometimes uh, I will print the entire block with a, with a color. If it's gonna be, you know, maybe a light tan or, or, or something like that. Um, and uh, so I'll be putting other colors on top of that. If I, if I want anything white, I actually carve that out very first thing. 
and that's actually just the white of the paper coming through um, and um, and that's how I get white. You can use white ink, uh, obviously, but uh, if you're using a, a white paper, anything you carve away won't ever get uh, ink on it again, and that stays uh, stays white. So um, that's usually the first step if there's uh, if there's white is to carve that out first, and then once I go through my list, I'll start and uh, say I may want to do a uh, blue, and I think. Um, we'll use this as an example here. This is my uh, view from the Heber Valley of, of Mount Timpanogos. Uh, there's actually no white on here. Um, and I'll drop in close-ups of these so you can see them a little better. But here along the top of the ridge line, it's actually a very faint pink. Um, that was what I did uh, um, the very first thing. So I, I put that uh, pink on and I didn't go over the whole block with it I just applied it with a roller along this top area and then the next thing uh, the next layer I did was this sky blue which actually incorporates two colors uh, I wanted a, a bit of a faint pink here along the horizon and so I actually mixed a little pink uh, along with this blue and do what I uh, use what I called a, a blended roll or a, a gradient roll where I can roll it and you always have to go the same direction but I um, uh, rolled that so there was this gradation from the pink to from the blue to the pink and uh, so that was the the next layer the third layer was this um, snow in the in the shadows and I did that the whole rest of the block and um, the next layer was the the scrub oak or the gambrel oak that's down here in the foothills um, the uh, the carving on that was a nightmare I think I figured it took me about 17 hours just to to cut that because it's just to get the right look and kind of the faint and scattered uh, effect of, of the scrub oak on the foothills was kind of a challenge. Uh, the next color I think I did was the uh, uh, the evergreens in the in the background there, a little cooler because it's uh, more in the distance. And um, actually I think I may have done these this rock in the sun before that. Uh, and then the pines, and then the uh, the darker rock in the shadows. Uh, in the foreground, I did this uh, kind of the tan trees, and then the final layer was the the trunks uh, of the trees as well. So you can kind of see that process, and I'll post uh, the actual. Uh, uh, individual photos of each layer in the video. Um, another one I just completed was uh, uh, fall uh, colors. This was a scene I think up in Logan Canyon. A friend of mine who's a very uh, talented photographer, his uh, photo was the one that inspired that. This one um, I started, you can just see a light tan down here which is just kind of the uh, ground in the foreground and uh, then did the sage uh, color and uh, the uh, and some of these I was able to actually do at the same time so because there's enough separation I was able to do some of these at the same uh, time so I did the, the lighter yellow and um, and I think the sage at the same time and then a little darker yellow and and maybe the the, the reddish uh, rusty color on the ground uh, then the orange and I did basically two colors of every color of the fall foliage uh, light and the dark just to get a little dimension in the trees so the same thing with the orange light and dark and um, uh, same thing with the uh, pink 
uh, reddish color. The final colors, this was a really good example of a print that looks chaotic. Uh, I posted on my Instagram page uh, progress shots of, of this and very few people guessed that it was fall colors until uh, the very end and it looked very chaotic uh, but it really is the dark colors that I put toward the end, the last two colors that all of a sudden created some order and a uh, sense where it's rec recognizable what the, the scene is and there are actually two colors of the, of the green. In a minute I'll, uh, I'll walk you through that uh, uh, process in terms of uh, the very last color that was, that was on here. Just to show you um, an example um, or the, part of the process. So here's this, this uh, the final version of the block. Sometimes I don't remove um, everything if I can create enough space so I won't get ink on other parts of it. I may leave a little part of it, but uh, carving is a pretty simple uh, process. And again, the same for wood or, or uh, linoleum. This, of course, is, is linoleum, and I'm just carving away the parts I don't want to uh, uh, print again. And um, I'm going to take this now, and I've got some ink set up, and I'm going to move the camera over here by the printing press and uh, just show you the final stages of the, of the process. This is the final layer. Of course, you're only going to see the dark, darkest green uh, uh, on the piece of paper I print, but you can I'll, I'll hold up both and you can see how they both look. Okay, so here I have my block and I've already put some ink that I've mixed out. And, and, and by the way, um, you know, ink comes in a, in a variety of, of colors, just like it does for oils and, and watercolors, but I, I never, uh, I don't think I've once been able to pull a color right out of the, the tube or the tin just the way I want it. Uh, one of the more time-consuming things is uh, mixing the, the color uh, exactly how you want it. Um, this is just the uh, sheet I keep so I can see the colors next to each other as I go along of all of the colors I used on this particular print. And um, some of those are earlier on and then I did another one that matched more closely. But there's a lot of time spent in, in mixing colors. So I've, I've got my roller um, and in this, in this particular print I use the rollers sometimes but I also will apply, um, and you'll see this from the, the, from the photos when I, uh, that I posted, uh, I actually applied the colors with either a sponge or a brush kind of a spot color because I, I didn't want uh, big areas that I had to cover with the, with the next layer. So you can actually apply the color in limited areas. In this case, I'll use a roller. taking a lot of time, a lot of times I do, you can still get ink on areas you've carved out where there's some little raised portions and a lot of times I will wipe that off. I'm not going to take the time to do that. But um, as you can imagine with multiple colors, uh, registration is, is a critical part of this. And, um, and, and so you have to have some method of being able to place the paper on the block in the exact same spot that um, each each time you put a, a layer down. So I'm taking this over to the press now, and uh, this happens to be uh, a registration jig that I use that's got these little metal pins, and uh, I'll put holes matching up with that exactly at the top of the paper. So. Um, slide this block of a, on a mark so I know that 
facts lined up exactly. And I'm just using newsprint now. I typically would use a nicer piece of paper. And then remove the jig. I put these on just to create just the right amount of pressure, although you can adjust it here as well. And run it through the press by hand. And I'm just going to run it back again so it stays in camera. Peel and reveal. So you can see that's just the most darkest green. Uh, this is the, the final layer. And side by side, you can see the finished, how that looked with uh, that last layer on it. So Probably the obvious question that uh, you're asking yourselves right now would, why would anybody choose to create art this way? <laughs> um, it requires a lot of patience and uh, it's time consuming. Um, there are a lot of constraints. I don't have, you know, when an oil painter is painting a scene, you know, every color is just mixed very uh, subtly and adding a little white or adding a little yellow or something like that. I'm limited in terms of if I do a uh, the, the Mount Tipinogos scene I think had uh, um, I think 11 uh, different colors um, I was actually able to do it in seven layers but um, you're, you're limited in the number you don't have an unlimited capacity to do colors, uh, color layers. Uh, so there's constraints in terms of the, the colors you use. Um, it, uh, as I said, it's, it's kind of high risk uh, if you make a mistake in terms of um, the order of the colors or carving away something you shouldn't have. You kind of have to uh, start over. Some things you can maybe repair if they're are pretty minor. It is time consuming. It'll take me, the Mount Tipinogos one with the carving and everything, probably took um, three weeks to, to complete. And um, you've got drying time. It, it's hard to print another color quickly, unlike uh, sp screen printing um, that Stephanie showed you. Uh, I'm, I can usually print the next day. I, I put a little drying agent in the ink and that helps. Otherwise, it may take three or four days to, to print in between layers. So it can be time consuming. And as I mentioned, it, it requires a lot of patience. But um, I actually enjoy the, the process. Uh, carving is, is a very tactile uh, process. Um, it's kind of part sculpture and, and, and part painting. And, it, uh, and it's very therapeutic to me. I, en I enjoy the carving. Uh, process. Um, it's also kind of a combination of left brain and right brain. You've got to figure out the strategic part and use your head in terms of what to do when, what color layers uh, to do when. And, and um, th there's some, some right brain thinking along, I mean left brain thinking along with the right brain creativity and color selection um, and design. Um, I actually like the challenge. I like working a little bit without uh, a net. 
uh, kind of uh, increases the uh, the stakes and uh, and it, and it, while you've got high risk on the one side, uh, it's, it's high reward. I mean, there's nothing quite like the exhilaration of when you peel and reveal and you realize, yeah, that, that layer is going to work. And particularly at the end, when you realize uh, that, yeah, the whole, the whole print's going to work because I can't tell you how many times I get in the middle stages and it's looking chaotic and, and messy. I, I say to myself, and Stephanie's heard me say this, I'm not sure if this is going to work. And uh, you really have to kind of trust the process and uh, see it through to the end and rely on your, your, your best judgment. And as I mentioned with that one woodcut I did of the fall colors, it actually didn't end up working out. And, uh, but I learned some things. Um, I had some, some sequence of the colors wrong on that one for one thing that I was able to correct on the, on the next one. And uh, a few other things that, so even, even a failed effort uh, there's learning involved and in, uh, kind of like life in that way uh, we all learn from our mistakes um, probably learn more from our mistakes than the things that go well because it's harder to identify why things go well but uh, trusting in the process sees you through to the end and and uh, getting to those darker colors that defines the other colors and, and uh, uh, actually makes the other colors brighter and, and, and pop is a beautiful thing to see. So I love, I love the process, uh, and uh, I, I like the risk. And it's nice that, uh, like other forms of printing, where you have multiple, uh, you can, you can generate multiple copies. That's the only thing that um, makes this worthwhile. Is that at the end of that three-week process, instead of with just one piece of art, I've got if I do an edition of twelve. And they all turn out, which is no given. Sometimes the rule of thumb is you lose 10% with each layer. Um, gratefully, I haven't had that experience, but I do occasionally uh, lose one where the registration's off or something else um, uh, doesn't work. But um, I actually have uh, 12, then I can um, then sell if they all turn out. So that's another nice thing. And the bottom line is with it all. I, I just love the way they look. I was immediately uh, taken by this the first time I ever saw a reduction woodcut down at a gallery in, in Carmel and I was so intrigued with it. I experimented with it when I came home and just read up on it. I'm largely uh, self-taught other than tips I get from Stephanie and others. But um, I, I just love the look of it. Uh, it's, it's unique and uh, um, it, it, it allows me to stand out when I'm in shows because it just doesn't look like other kinds of art it has its own appeal and so um, that's what keeps me coming back that's what keeps me uh, uh, putting up with the, the uh, anxiety and uh, frustration of, of this process glad to share it with you feel free to ask me any questions uh, either shoot me an email or next time we can get together and uh, uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, give you a few more details about uh, my process, how I do what I do, and why I enjoy what I do. Thanks. See you, everybody.